Imagine if you were able to watch your great grandparents tell stories from their lives. What made them laugh? What moved them? How they responded to adversity and triumph? And what impacted their existence? That would be a treasure. Now you can offer that gift to your loved ones. Hello, I'm Dennis Tardon. For more than 45 years, I've been a professional interviewer, documenting the lives and times of hundreds of people. I will guide you or your family member through the important stories of your lives using my unique interviewing skills. I'm now offering my legacy interviews worldwide via Zoom from the comfort of you or your loved one's own home. All you need is a webcam and I will do the rest. Contact me today to schedule your legacy interview. Cruising with LR. Hi, I'm Linda Rose, aka LR. I'm your host of Cruising with LR. Cruising with LR is going to have something for everybody, and it'll be happening weekly on Tuesdays at 8:30 p.m. The cool thing about my show is that it's going to have four categories that are paired with the four weeks in a month. Week one is sports. Week two is influencer. Romeo. Oh, Romeo. Where for art thou, Romeo? Week three is arts. Now, uh, scoot down a bit. All right, uh, just go back to the right. Week four, we'll be reading and writing. For the poetry piece I'm going to be reading today is Dust of Snow by Robert Frost. The way a crow shook down on me, the dust of snow from a hemlock tree has given my heart a change of mood and saved some part of the day I had rude. The reason I did all these categories is so that everybody has something to look forward to on my show. For example, if someone's more interested in the sports than they are in arts, they know look for week one's episode, not week three's. My first episode will air September 5th at 8.30 p.m. and I will have a Facebook group called Cruising with OR that I will be very active on and I encourage you all to be active on as well. And you guys being active on can include um, like live streams and posts and anything you want to post on there. Um, I will have a Instagram, which is Linderose underscore photography 07, no caps. And my TikTok is linderose.k with no caps. Thank you guys so much. And I can't wait to first September 5th. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Journeys. We are live right now. And so we welcome our live global audience on all the different platforms. And we also want to say hi to the replay squad. We love you guys. We don't want you to feel left out. And if you have anything to say to our guest or to us, even if you're not live, you can always inbox M or myself or even just write a comment on anywhere that you're watching and we will get back to you, right? Um, <laughs> So, Em, you know that we have been, I've been fangirling out a little bit about this one for a lot of different reasons. <laughs> and uh, I always ask you to take, take responsibility for some of that based on the poster. And <laughs> <laughs> well, take us a little bit through your journey with meeting Paul and bringing us to this beautiful moment. So, 
I happen to catch him on Instagram, although he says he's more active on TikTok. I, I caught him on Instagram. And um, he was saying something to the point of, despite what you've heard before, I'm going to tell you the real story or, you know, to that effect. And, and he had me there because normally when you're talking about anything in the, in the industry, the entertainment industry, production and, you know, any of that, mm -hmm. we all know that half of what you hear is not the reality of how it Absolutely. is. Absolutely. If you're yep. talking about being an actor, a performer, uh, it doesn't matter. Until you've done it or spoken to someone who's actually done it, you are not getting the full story. So I really appreciated that. And then I saw that he was writing a book and I'll let him tell the title of his book, but the title of the book was similar and that caught my eye. And I, I just was like, this guy's fantastic. I love it. And he's yeah, camera is great with his lives he's funny but mm -hmm. direct and i really appreciate that and um yeah i'm excited i'm excited to hear what he's got to say the title of his book and and i think we're you're right we should let him say it it's shocking every single time i come across it even just in the promos we've been doing i stop and it takes me a second it's yeah. really shocking so he understands how to grab an audience oh, an yeah. audience's attention he's written some for amazing, amazing actors and for iconic uh, shows and everything. So he's somebody who really has helped by his writing to shape a lot of the culture that we have right now. A lot of the culture, this a lot of the entertainment culture, which seeps down into actual society. And so he's a really important guy. He's a mover, he's a shaker. And he's someone who, even if you haven't heard of his name, you've probably watched something where an actor you love has said the words that yeah. he writes, which is such cool power, right? How awesome is that? Mm -hmm. It's like the Wizard of Oz, sort of the right. puppet master here. Yeah, I'm excited to hear what he's got, all of his stories and questions. And, and yep. hopefully the audience will participate, guys. If you have any questions, throw them at us. If he can answer them or we can, we will. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. This is going to be good. He's, he's going to be smart and articulate and funny. This will be great. He's, he's going to, we're going to learn a lot, I think. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, do play the intro video and then we'll just bring him right on up. What do you think? Perfect. All right, here we go. I don't think you can ever learn screenwriting in a classroom by reading books, by doing anything other than writing and writing and writing yourself in your voice, your way again and again and again. I can't write anything without music. I have to create a playlist for every single project I write. And I always have throughout my entire career. You know, you've heard me talk about switching the field, my new environment, I was inspired or whatever. But the thing is, when the muse shows, you gotta respect the muse. No matter what you're doing, drop everything and go to work. It was I sold a show a few years back and it was a big bidding war and the show ended up not going. I was able to do something very rare in Hollywood, which is all the rights came back to me. I retained 100% of the rights. Um, I can talk about what the story is in detail in another video. It's not, it's not secret or anything. It's, it's based on a true story of the first ever all African-American squad of detectives in St. Louis, Missouri. It's pretty amazing, pretty amazing story. And I'm very excited about it. Um, you all inspired me to write the book. Pre-orders are live. And again, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all. There it is. There's the book. So let's bring him on to talk about it. Yes. Thank you for being here, Paul. Thank you so much. And I, I want to I wanna reiterate, when he was in that video talking about how when the muse comes, the muse comes, he was on vacation. <laughs> okay. He's up in a working vacation. Yep, you gotta you gotta go. You gotta when it's when it calls, it calls. So that was but it's a good place to work, you know, down in Mexico. I bet. Yeah. I bet. It's beautiful. That just way you took that filming was was beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're very fortunate. We have a I've got a little place down in, in Cabo, and so it's just a nice way to get away. It's not I live in Arizona right now, and so it's a really quick you know, flight down there, it's easy to get to, but it's, you know, it's a whole different world. And sometimes you just need to decompress. And right. so, so it's, I'm, I'm very blessed to be able to, to have that place to go down there. But, uh, but yeah, that morning was like, I woke up and I just, it was just, there was a story in my head that had to get out. So I had to go, go to work. Yeah. Renee and I 
we'll sometimes text in the middle of the night and she'll be like, what are you doing up? I'm just sending it for you for the morning. And I'm like, what are you doing up? Like, yeah. We're all to of inspiration. We got to finish what we're doing. Creativity does not run on a clock. And I know that there are some writers that claim that it does. I, I know authors and writers who say, no, 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 they, they schedule it. You know what I mean? And I know that even the Beatles used to stop for a cuppa at four o'clock in the studio and then right back to it, lads. But I do think that the vast majority of creative people, it's like you might be the most exhausted ever. And that's when the muse strikes you and you just have to get up right. and do it. And and other times when you're under the pressure of a deadline, it just doesn't flow as naturally. So I'm glad to hear you say it. I wanted to start off talking about the book because, of course, uh, people can get it starting tomorrow. Correct. And they can pre-order it now. It is. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, and I always awesome. credit you credit um, your followers for it's something that came about from um, quarantine. Um, no, not really. So the, the the quick origin story of this. So I, I know. And first of all, I as I say in the preface of the book, I want to make it very clear. I am firmly in the animal lovers contingent. I love dogs. <laughs> I love cats, but kill the dog is a reference one yes i'm taking a shot at the you know grand book of all screenwriting books save the cat um but there's also a point to it because you know the save the cat book again one of the many books that just tells you things that are wrong like you have to have you have to have your hero save a cat you know do something great in the first few pages and so this title was born from that but also john wick you know the one of the biggest, most successful franchises in recent cinematic history doesn't have him save a cat in the opening. It has the killing of a dog as its inciting incident. So, but the origin story real quick. So I, um, in 2021, right? What are we in 2023 now? So in 2021, I decided I had been through 2020 with the pandemic and everything, I had a show that like everyone else didn't go and we were suddenly all quarantined. Yep. And so I started like offering to help out people online. If you want me to read your script and give you professional notes and feedback instead of paying, you know, some random website or some person who may know less about screenwriting than you do, go ahead and hit me up. I thought I might get a few people. I was, overwhelmed with the response and I had so many people and I, I didn't want to turn anyone down. So I, it was a lot of work between like the second half of 2020 through the first half of 2021. All I was doing was reading other people's work and scripts. So I finally thought, okay, I need to somehow slow this down, but I still want to help people. So I created this website. I had a buddy of mine build this website called screenwriting truth. And you could go there and I started charging money, not like, hey, I'm going to get rich off these people, but just sort of in order to call the herd, so to speak, which might sound awful, but I really wanted to work with people who were really serious. So that's one, they'll pay for it. But also right. it was my time and I was, I was taking my time away from my day job of professional screenwriting to do this. And and I really put a lot of effort into it when I do it with people and they, they get to zoom with me. They get, it's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. It's not just like I read their script and say, here's what sucks. Um, <laughs> and so the website was popular. And then the guy who designed my website said, you've got to promote the website, man. You've got to get on social media. And the only thing I was on was Instagram at the time, which was like, you know, photos of food. And so he got me on TikTok um, at the beginning of 2022. And I just started making videos talking about screenwriting and it kind of blew up. And by the summer of 2022, I had like, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 followers or something. And everybody was like, how come you don't write a book? When are you gonna write a book? You're always talking about all the books that are wrong. And I thought, well, why don't I write a book? Like, and that's what it was born out of. And uh, and I just found out today, it's crazy. The book the book comes out tomorrow, September first. And I looked back this morning at some notes and documents and emails, and it was September first of twenty twenty two 
was the day that I wrote the very first sentence for the book. So it's exactly. Wow. Wow. Crazy. Love it. And then it comes out tomorrow, right? What's tomorrow? That's exciting. I mean, is that kind of normal? I mean, I don't know. How long does it usually take from start to finish to write? No, so that, that's a great question because I, so I started writing the book and I, I just started writing it. I never once thought like, how am I going to get it published? What am I going to do? I just started writing the book. And then at the end of 2022, I was coming to the end of the first draft basically. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? And so I, I queried some, some literary agents that I know, not Hollywood agents, but like book agents, New York agents. And they were all like, you know, your best shot's probably a university press as opposed to like a big traditional publisher. So in January and February of this year, I sent a book proposal to about 10 or 12 university presses, um, Texas, NYU, Northwestern, all the, the big well-known ones. And actually three of them wanted to publish the book. Um, but the earliest that any of those three, the earliest one they could guarantee me at getting on shelves was the end of 2024. Mm. And I'd been talking about it so much on TikTok and social media. And I was so, I'd fallen in love with the process of, of writing the book. I really, it turned into a labor of love. And so I made the decision that I was just going to publish it myself. And so it's, it's, you know, the dirty word in publishing, self-publishing. Mm. People don't even say it anymore. They say, oh, I'm an indie published author. Yeah. Um, I'm self-published. I put this book out with Ingram Spark, um, myself this summer, and they've been fantastic and it's really high quality. Uh, you can't tell the difference between it and something from Simon and Schuster. And I'm, I'm really excited, but that's, that's why it's, it only took a year from the, from the first sentence to, to it being available. Right. And you know what? Things have really changed, though, both in the music publishing world yeah. and in the book publishing world, where it used to be that dirty word. But now a lot of people who have the option to go with like Simon & Schuster actually choose yeah. to do it because they get more money. And if you go with the major publishing houses, you still they still expect you to do most of the editing, most of the promo. They want you to have an inbuilt fan. You know, really, you're kind of doing everything and then you're losing a lot of the control and then you're losing a lot of the money. So I do know people who have said, I actually am choosing to do it. And, you know, so I think we kind of have to I think the culture has evolved and I think the industry has evolved where um, I still agree with you that it has like that weird, dirty, like, ah, uh, like maybe we couldn't get published elsewhere thing. But actually, the reality is that people are choosing it. And it's the same thing in music where people yeah. are creating their own labels and their own, own publishing uh, companies because control is also really important too. And you get I think to too, people nowadays see it as like anti establishment, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, like, and so look, people are embracing I mean it more than we used to. Yeah. And they're like the absolute without question, biggest best-selling author in the world right now is Colleen Hoover, who self-published everything until finally the, you know, whoever random house or whoever threw so much money at her, but she was a self-published author. She was just in her trailer in Oklahoma, putting books onto, you know, the internet. Yeah. Right. And the same thing with like social media where I know, I know entertainers, who they went the traditional route and then they said, I'm making more money and I have better control by doing my own, by actually just doing, making my own content and sort of being that one man army. So it's just a different era, especially after quarantine, especially after COVID, we're seeing a lot more people being totally yeah. independent and really proud of it too. Um, we have a question from Manny Zamora. He's a host here on the network, but he's also an author. And he wanted to know how you feel about publishing on, on Amazon as a platform. Oh, so so that's I can actually answer that with a, a bit of an informed opinion, because one of the things I did, and I think it's born out of my my writer self and being, you know, research being such a big deal is when I made this decision to do it myself, to, to say no to, to the university presses, I really went down the rabbit hole of research. And I must have I probably spoke to at least at least a dozen really successful independent authors, self-published authors. And I learned, you know, draft a digital Ingram spark and 
whatever else and Amazon and the pros and cons of everything. And what I, the, the decision I made is I did my paperback, my, my print copy through Ingram Spark. And I did my Kindle, my, my ebook and my audio book, which will come out in a few weeks through Amazon. And the reason that I split it up is I, I really came to learn that Ingram Spark is sort of the gold standard for print books. If you want a book in print, that's the that's the way to go. They're just their quality's higher. They're also part of Ingram Book Company, which is simply the largest book distributor in the world. And so like even Amazon orders their books from Ingram Book Company. And so I got to be affiliated with them. So my distribution became worldwide as opposed to when you publish with Amazon, you only sell at Amazon. They don't let you get into independent bookstores. They don't let, you know, it's Amazon. You are, you are part of their family. It's like Omerta, you know, you don't, you don't go against the family. And so my, my eBooks, cause I'm different than a lot of independent authors, my eBook sales, I'm, I'm assuming or, or estimating is a better word that probably no more than maybe 10% of my audience are going to be ebook people. Most of them are going to be print and then audio. And so I did audio through ACX, which is Amazon and, and audible.com, which I'm a huge fan of. I listen yeah. to audiobooks all the time. Me too. Yeah. And they're just, they're again, they're the gold standard for audiobooks. And I really believe Amazon KDP is the best for ebooks. So that's why I broke it up um, for mine. Right. And then we wanted to, um, so Manny says, very good advice. Thank you. And um, I wanted to ask about the Audible experience. So you said you're in the midst of doing that right yeah. now, recording the, the, I always prefer when the author, him or herself records it. And I know that's not always possible, but for me, it, that really adds such a great dimension because you can hear like the Michelle Obama one. Sometimes she would say something in print, but you could tell by the tone of her voice in the Audible that she kind of meant something a little sassy or that she had maybe like a, a frown. I feel on her that face. way about um, closed captioning. Right. I prefer to watch a movie with closed captioning in the original version because you get their emotion, their exactly their, their acting. Yeah. And it's almost like, yeah. So it's like that added dimension. So talk a little bit about the process practically and then also the emotional connection of you actually reading your own book and how that feels. Yeah. So that was, again, a, I think a very sort of happy accident where, where I think, you know, some higher power was kind of in control of this whole journey because originally I have a really good friend uh, who's a New York actor named Malachi Weir. And you'd know his face the second you see him. You may not know his name. He was on Billions for two or three seasons. He's done a bunch of stuff. And Malachi has the voice of all voices, you know, it's like I, I, I describe his voice as being a cross between Denzel and James Earl Jones. And he my plan was always Mal's going to record the audiobook, And so we were prepping that this summer and it was going to be tough because he was going to record it in New York and then I was going to have to listen to it in Arizona and then send notes back. And it was going to be ridiculous, to be honest. Yes. But I had it in my head of Mal doing it. Well, as luck would have it, something came up in his personal life, nothing, nothing bad, but he couldn't commit to the time. He couldn't do it. And now I was up against the clock because I was only two months till my book was coming out. So I was like, all right, I'm going to record it myself. Oh my gosh. You know, this is going to be a nightmare, but I found an amazing sound studio with a recording engineer here in Tucson. That's one of these little, you look at the outside and even when you walk in and it, it's like this place should have been condemned years ago, but then you get a little deeper <laughs> into the studio and you see like Credence recorded there, wow. you know, and yeah. Rush recorded there, and and oh, like those little places. blues musicians. And I just I'm getting chills right now just because I was in that space and it was amazing. I had Jim Waters was my my engineer and. We did it. It took me about five days, about four or five hours a day recording it. Wow. I had to actually work my, like the first day was two hours and my voice was gone. 
Yeah, I was going to say, how do you do that? It's like a marathon for your voice. That is incredible. I mean, I'm used to nonstop talking, but not everybody is. (laughs) Right. So I, what I did, I went to TikTok and said, hey, voiceover actors, help me. What do Mm -hmm. I do? And they gave me all these tips about you got to cut dairy out of your diet right. for three days before you record you got to drink all this water you have to have slippery honey. elm <laughs> like and so i started doing all that and it and it worked right. and then a, a really cool thing happened what you alluded to in the beginning of this is it was the right thing for me to record this myself because mm-hmm. this book is written so much in my voice i mean it's yes it's a book on screenwriting but it's also a memoir. And it's also, I get, there's a lot of really personal, vulnerable stories in this about my time in Hollywood. And it was just the right thing to do, like recording it myself, my inflections, my turns of phrase, you know, everything. It just, it, it was the right thing to do. And it, and it turned out great. I hope. I'm Can't getting it's awesome. I, I just want to say one thing real quick. Um, we're getting some questions in. We'll, we'll yep. put them up. But guys, we have a little bit, uh, just about a half hour left. And I am going to personally purchase one of the books. And we will pick a winner from everybody who asks a question for Paul. So get your questions in. That'll put your name in. I'll go back through the comments after. And Renee and I will pick who is in there and, and draw our name. And you will get a copy of Paul's book. That's lovely. Isn't that exciting? And so now we have, um, well, we have a question from us. So this is 15-year-old Lily May, and she's a musician, and she loves books, and I'm assuming she's probably going to write some books in in the future. She wants to know if you feel that self-publishing your book made it so that you could keep more creative control. I think, yes. I, I mean, I didn't do it initially for that reason, but I learned that that's true. What what you actually spoke uh, spoke to in the beginning is a- absolutely. If I had to do this whole thing over again, I would do it the exact same way I did it. And it's because there were a couple of of headaches, I'll call them, with the with the self publishing this summer. But they were only because I was ignorant of it. And once I learned the process, it was fantastic because of exactly what you said. I had complete creative control. I was able to, you know, go in and, and, you know, as, as writers, it's, it's very tough to ever say, okay, it's done. So even like as late as August 18th, I was still making changes to the, to the book, to the document. And I couldn't have done that if I hadn't self-published. Yeah. You'd be under a deadline. Absolutely. Deadline. I swear that's the number one reason for writer's block. (laughs) <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, we need that. We need that promo by Friday. Okay, you probably shouldn't have told me that. No. Suddenly, yeah, it's like it's, it's um, you get paralyzed, right? It's sometimes. Well, I do anyway. You find this. I find. I don't know if you two experience this. I and this has been my whole career. I will. It will take me as long to write something, whatever the time is that they give me. If if I have six months to write it, it'll take me six months. If yep. I have two weeks to write it. I get it done in two weeks. Yep, absolutely. Same thing here. Same thing here. Um, I'm one of those people that will go over it and go over it and go over it and go over it. Or if I'm editing a video, I go over it a hundred times. And really, by the time I'm done, it's it's one of the first drafts I did. Like, (laughs) I had it right. I just overanalyze it if I have too much time. Yep. Um, We have a question from Jamie Bennett. She said, "What is your writing process?" Oh my gosh. I don't think we have enough time to go through it all, but <laughs> I, I will say I have an entire chapter in the book where I walk the reader through my entire process on two different projects. One, a spec script, which means a script I just wrote of my own, my own idea, and then an episode I did of NCIS New Orleans. So you get to see a snapshot of how my process differs and how it's the same when I'm under contract working on a series and when I'm just writing for myself real quickly, my process is I'm, I'm super disciplined. I write six days a week. I'm up by five, five 30 at the latest every day. I'm an early morning writer. I have learned through trial and error that I'm at my best in the early mornings. And I write until 
it's just not there anymore. And that may be, I may have a day where I only write three hours. I may have a day where I write seven or eight hours. I don't put any pressure on myself. That's the other big thing I've, I've learned is, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, when the muse shows, you've got to respect the muse. When the muse shows, you have to be there. You have to be ready. And I found for me, that means I have to show up every single day, even when the muse hasn't shown up for 47 days in a row, I still need to be there at the keyboard, at the notebook, whatever, working. And even if I'm not physically typing, I'm still working. And it's through that discipline that then when the muse does show, you're you're ready and you just suck it all in and you hit that really rare you know, flow state that all writers aspire to where it's just coming out of you faster than you can type. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention that uh, Renee, he brought up NCIS. Your oh, yes. Oh, so I didn't. Renee I, is being very, me, very I'm professional. It, but... I'm all over it, Em. Don't you worry. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm keyed into that. When like, I put the poster up and she saw the photo like of you and Scott, Scott she was like. We have, a, we have a, whole, a whole inside joke. It's like I've met all of my heroes. I've worked with most people that I've always, except Scott Bakula. He's very elusive. I've never tried to get in touch with him or anything, but I've never worked with him. I've never known anyone who's worked with him. Funny. And uh, I'm watching NCIS New Orleans, which I hadn't watched for you know, I actually hadn't started, but I'm a huge Quantum Leap fan. But now I'm watching it once we I knew you were going to be here. Such an amazing show. And Scott is just absolutely amazing. I love his accent that he does in that. And so uh, we Em showed me the picture of you with Scott. So any Scott Bakula uh, stories you have would be much appreciated. <laughs> um, I will I will say I have worked with many, many actors, obviously, and clearly some I never want to see again, let alone work again, work with again. We and don't know others, what that's like. No, yeah, never heard of that before. What yeah. do you mean? And and others are wonderful. And Scott is absolutely in the latter category. He was a consummate professional. He was always on time. He never I mean, this guy was the show and could have easily been the diva of all divas and he wasn't like he treated everybody he treated the craft service person the same as he treated the head of the studio and that's just scott bacula he's fantastic and and i have a i have a story one of the very emotional stories in the book i i tell is i wrote an episode of ncis new orleans and it was my last episode for the series and i i wanted to write about my father who passed away from alzheimer's um, <laughs> excuse me. And, uh, Scott was magnificent. He not only did he get it. Yeah. Um, but he, <coughs> he protected the story for me. Protected the story. That's beautiful. I, I can totally. I'm going through this with my mom right now, like right now. So, yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Um, no, I'm no, no, no. Em, no hey. This is beautiful because Paul, um, Em Live. is talking. Em is going through exactly the same thing, and I'm also going through that with my dad with Parkinson's at this very like right now. So that was very beautiful, yeah. and what a beautiful testament about Scott Bakula and that type of integrity and dignity that he brings to his roles, which is why he was Captain Archer, which is why he was Dr. Sam Beckett. He gets that he has that warmth. And so I haven't seen that episode yet because I'm going in order. But when I see it, I'm going to be thinking of you, Paul. I'll probably send you a little note. And I think it's beautiful that you infuse your actual life into your work that you have that connection this is actually really. And, and to be honest with you, you just mm -hmm. made a huge emotional connection to your book. So more people are going to be like, Oh, I need to hear his story as well as learning about screenwriting. That's beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You. Well, it was, it, it's, I mean, that's what I preach about, not just in the book, but to anyone is, you know, you, you've got to put yourself on your, on the page. Every, every scar is a story and, and don't waste your pain, you know? Don't waste, don't your, waste pain. your pain. I love, that. I love it. Don't I always waste say your don't pain. waste your minute, but don't waste your pain is beautiful. That's going to be the follow up book to kill the yes. devil. I'm already calling that That's out. That's going to be I'm the one he writes it. about us, Renee. That is going to be the one. <laughs> um, don't waste your pain. 
in the app. I love that. We have a we have that. a we have a host who's a musician on the network, and his name is um, Tom Cheshire, and he always says, "Don't waste your heartbeats," you know, and. I, don't waste your pain is such a beautiful thing. Don't and I think that artists always can, whenever you're going through something so hard in your life, I don't know how people who aren't artists deal with it. Because for me, I immediately yeah. process it into a song or a story or a book, you know, I immediately process it that way or into acting. I don't know what the muggles do. I don't know what the muggles I do. Know, yeah. It's, we had to it's like put um, that energy. There's a right. great Graham, Graham Greene's one of my favorite authors. Me and, too. Me and too. And he's got an amazing quote about that where he says, I don't understand how people who aren't artists don't go insane. Right. Yep. How I, maybe you, they how are. Do you not channel everything. There's also a great Graham Greene quote where he was acting like a total asshole. And somebody said to him, why are you such an asshole? You go to, to Catholic mass every single day. And Graham said, would you want to see me if I didn't? Like, like that's a, and I always love that quote is like, he's trying, this is me at my best buddy. You don't want to, um, all right. So Manuel, who's an, actually, who's an wait, author. I have one question. Oh, real okay. quick. Can you go on to Paul, put Paul up on the screen? I want to ask him a question about, yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you, that piece of art in the corner of your room behind oh. you is amazing. That's amazing. So is yeah, it? it is. So that it's, one of my favorite artists is Basquiat, and that's yes. actually not a, a paint. That's actually wallpaper, but, and I have to give all the credit to my amazing girlfriend who actually is a painter and artist. She came up with the idea of, instead of just putting up wallpaper, put it up and frame it and make it look like a painting. So. Oh my that's, God, that's gorgeous. Yeah, so that's what it is, so. I love yeah. that. I love That's that. That's gorgeous. I've been sitting there eyeing it on TikTok and stuff. I'm like, I need to know more about that. Yeah. That's amazing. I didn't even realize it was that large. Oh, good for her. That's Can gorgeous. we look up your girlfriend's, what's her name? If we can, does you she can. sell art? Or you can look up her Instagram, her art. Yeah. Uh, it's Her name's about- Michelle Monteleone. And I think her Instagram's Michelle Monteleone Fine Art. You're going to have to spell that for us, Paul. I'm pretty sure you're going to have to spell that for us. It's uh, it's Michelle with two L's and then M-O-N-T-E-L-E-O-N-E. Okay. And if, if you just go on Instagram, it'll come up and then she has her personal account, but then her art account is Michelle Montalioni Fine Art. Awesome. Then she does exhibitions and shows and she stuff. does. She's done shows. Yeah. She has, she's got like, she commissions, like people just hit her up and say, Hey, will you paint me something? And she's got like the whole basement of our home is, is her art studio. And she's doing, she's That's working amazing. on like three commissions right now. That's really amazing. One of the projects I'm working on right now with different partners is we're putting together an art gallery down, um, oh, wow. down South. So we're starting to look ahead to next year and different ex- exhibitions. So I'll, I'll check her out and I'll definitely send her a contacts to some of my oh, great. partners. Uh, now, uh, MM, you started something here with this question. We got a lot of questions. So uh, l- let's, Let's see. Manuel said, I've read other books on screenwriting, like the Sid Field book. What makes yours different? And by the way, he loves the twist on Save the Cat. (laughs) So here's what makes mine different, um, Manuel, is so when I decided to write this book, I did a Google search for books on screenwriting. And there were over 70 that had been published since Sid's, which was the original screenplay back in 1979. Of those 70 some books, two of them were written by actual working professional screenwriters and one of those was a parody sid field was a completely failed screenwriter the only movie credit he ever got is listed as one of the worst films ever made of the 1960s he was an unemployed screenwriter that's why he decided to write the book to make money by telling other people how to do it same with blake snyder same with robert mckee all these gurus and charlatans and I, and look, they may have been wonderful, lovely human beings. They were failed screenwriters. They tried to do it and they were not any good at it. And the reason they weren't any good at it is because they tried to do it the way their books all preach to do, which is from formula and from math equations and from, you know, something they all mistakenly call structure. It's not how you write screenplays. And every single, there's a reason like 
Save the Cat sold over 6 million copies. Robert McKee's story sold 4.5 million. I don't know how many copies Sid Field has sold, probably both more than both combined. How many working professional screenwriters have you ever heard point to one of those books and say, that's how I learned to be a screenwriter? You don't. There are none. Yeah. And there's a reason for that because everything in the books is wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because it's the tail wagging the dog. They're, they're putting the, all the math ahead of story and ahead of writing. And so the reason that the subtitle on my book is the first book on screenwriting to tell you the truth is because that's what I've got 250 pages and you know, at least half of them, if not more, are, are talking about that. Like, here's what you've been indoctrinated to believe. Here's why it's not true. And I provide irrefutable evidence right. of it and documentation of it. And so that's, that's how mine's different. It's, it's, trust me, it's not like any book on screenwriting that's ever been written. In fact, I had a, a friend of mine, a, is a, an eight, my, my Hollywood agent said he was a little concerned that um, because I take so many shots at this industry of screenwriting gurus, that there may be some pushback on my book, that they may go in and leave bad reviews and do everything mm -hmm. because I'm really taking a shot at this giant industry of websites and social media and send me 50 bucks or 300 bucks and I'll give you coverage on your script or feedback or right. notes. And it's all a con. It really, right. really, truly is. Yes. So yeah. that's absolutely. That's so I'm sure you helped a lot of people. I'm sure you did. Cause it, like you said, they would have been out there reaching for all these false, false, uh, fake news. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, you know, fake there are people talk about, you know, Oh, the blacklist or we screen yeah. play or screen craft and you send your money in and you send your script in and you get this, these notes back from these nameless, faceless individuals. You have mm -hmm. no idea who they are. They just say there are screenwriting experts and they may be a, barista down the street right you know, exactly. about screen exactly. writing than you do which right. this is a great place for you to, to mention some of the stuff you've worked on and we talked about ncis which is of course a huge i mean everybody has seen ncis um do you want to talk a little bit about for those who don't know yeah. what are some of the things that you've worked on well i've been so the one thing again is unlike the others and again i, I don't mean to to trash people but I'm not somebody that tried it and then failed and couldn't do it. I've been a working professional screenwriter every single year since 1999. I'm in my 24th year, 25th year of doing it. It's what I put on my taxes every year. As recently as right before the strike, I was an employed screenwriter. Right. And so I've, I've written on shows, Felicity, Judging Amy, Leverage, The Librarians, NCIS New Orleans. Um, I've run shows. I was the showrunner on Librarians. I was a co-executive producer on NCIS New Orleans. Um, I've written feature films. Um, if you saw Geostorm, I apologize. I'll reimburse you for your ticket. <laughs> See, um, I love I love my sci-fi. I'm all about it. <laughs> um, but I but I I just I know what I'm talking about. I what right. I my what I I quote Harlan Ellison a couple times in the book. Um, one of my favorite quotes all time is Harlan Ellison said, you are not entitled to your opinion. You are only entitled to your informed opinion. And I agree with that. Absolutely. I have an informed opinion on not just what it took 30 years ago to That's an amazing know, to see, uh, way to think of that. But what it, what it takes right now. And, and that's what the, the book's really about. And so I've done over 200 hours of series television I, like I said, I've written feature films that have grossed um, half a billion dollars. So I, I've, and I, plus I've done a ton of work that never made, you know, I've written so many pilots that didn't make it to the screen and sure. you yeah. know, movies yeah. that didn't get That's everyone. part of the industry. You got to yeah, do no, that. That's the street cred. That's anything actually... creative. I mean, how many yeah. people, I can't tell you the number of things I've done and failed. If I counted yeah. the number of times I failed, I would be, I'd be here for a while. But that's how I you learn. An extra Mr. couple episodes. That, you know what? That's a great point to bring up because there's 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 two ways you can fail, I believe. You can fail and you can take the L as a learning experience and you can get better from it and you can drive and push harder and keep working. 
or you can fail and blame everyone else and just quit. And that's what these gurus did who wrote all these books. Mm. And so, I mean, I've made more mistakes than anyone I know. I've failed countless times. I still fail in my professional career. And yet it's, it's what you learn from that that is the difference. Right. Um, we have a question about um, writer's block. How do you overcome writer's block? Um, you know, it's, it's all, it's all different there. You know, writers have debated the term writer's block for, for decades and decades. Um, whether you believe in it or don't believe in it, it's, it's basically what I do. If I like, here's what happened. This is a true story that just recently happened to me. I, I have this project I'm working on. It's a very important thing. Um, and I had a lot of, I kind of had a perfect storm of things happen in my personal life uh, a few weeks ago that all kind of converged at once. And it just shut me down creatively. And it was, I was still getting up and sitting at the computer every day or doing my, you know, research or whatever, but nothing was happening. I, you know, it was two weeks went by a full two weeks where I didn't write a single word. So if that's, writer's block, that's what I experienced. And what I've learned, again, through trial and error is to never, we all have enough pressure on ourselves. So don't put any more pressure on yourself by mm -hmm. you have to write, you know, you've got to push through this, you got to do this. I just, I let it go. And I just knew it's going to come back at some point. I wanted to write every day, and I just couldn't. And eventually, you know, time, went by and my personal life situation, the, the pain, the struggle was the anxiety was dissipating. And then one night I was sitting and like I said, I'm an early morning writer. I, I rarely write after 5 p.m. ever. And one night I was it was like 738 o'clock. I was home alone and I just I, I wanted to write, but I hadn't been able to. So I opened up my screenwriting software to a blank page and I started writing a short film. And I mean, really short. It's, it's barely, it's like two and a half pages long. It's nothing. It would be like a two minute short film. And I wrote it and I, it was just a story I just made up and it was so freeing and so relaxing and so like, Oh yeah, you're a writer. And I just enjoy it. I just had fun doing it. And I rewrote it like four times because even though it was two and a half pages, we always rewrite everything. And then the next morning I woke up my same routine, got my coffee made, sat down and I was able to start working again. Wow. So I just, I try never to put pressure on myself. The other thing I do is if I'm struggling aside from like the personal life struggles, which I was experiencing, if I'm struggling with a particular project, if I just, it's just not there, I will consciously work on another type of writing. I'll write a short story. I'll write uh, a work on a play, a novel, you know, nonfiction book, uh, prose writing, as opposed to screenwriting. Right. It's, it's just an, another type because it's all writing. And sometimes when you focus on something totally different, it kind of unclogs the creative drain so you can get back to your. Yeah. And sometimes I find if I'm having trouble, whether it's, <clears throat> excuse me, writer's block, if I'm writing something or just creativity in general, having a block to do a video or promoter, promotional artwork or whatever I'm working on. Sometimes it's because something I need that break like there's something in me that I need whether it's food a drink rest like you said change your environment like sometimes you just need something but you're ignoring those signs because you've got to get this done you know yeah and, and, and then if I get up and I I try these di few different things and then I'm like yeah. oh, I, feel so much better. I, I feel like because writers are artists whether you're a musician a painter a writer right the artist soul is a very fragile thing. And I think there's why there's, there's so many mental health issues in, in our world. And one of the things I preach is you have to be kind to yourself. You have to read your emotional state. And if it's, if it's just not coming, that's okay. Even if you're on a deadline, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You'll get it done. Just, 
just be kind to yourself because I just don't know of any writers that or any kind of artists that create their best work when they're filled with anxiety and stress and fear. Yep. You know? That's so true. That's really true. And this was related to it. Ilana wanted to know, are you able to walk away? How did you learn when a work is done? And I think you addressed this a little bit at the beginning, but yeah, it's hard to sort of let go of a project or anything that you're working yeah, on. That's How do you my deal with hard that? thing. If I'm given too much time, I'm going to look at it a hundred times. When yep. if I'm given less time, it's like, okay, done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true for, for all artists. And, and just look, the one thing I want to make sure I say here too is, everybody's process is unique to them. So anybody listening, don't think, oh, I have to write the way Paul writes, or I have to write the way M writes, or I have everybody's process is unique to them. And so I'm like you in the sense that I will constantly tinker with something, but I've just learned again through trial and error, through my experience through all these years of doing it professionally, that I kind of just learn the signs now where I know when I'm still making something better as opposed to, oh, I'm just afraid to let go of this, you know, and I, right. I'm just self-aware enough now that I can just, you know, say, okay. Yeah. We're, we're running out of time. We only have like 10 minutes left, but um, I wanted to ask you, do you think after all the screenwriting and then writing your book, which did you, would you prefer to write books or do you like doing the screenwriting? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, if I, if, if, if the magic genie came to me and asked me what I wanted to do with my life, any vocation at all, I would still choose writer um, mm -hmm. because that's just who I am. But I, I would, I would love to be a full-time prose writer. I, I had a blast doing this book nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the middle of my first novel, which is so much fun. I want to write a play this year, although I'm running out. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask if you do that. I can't wait to have year. him back to promote all this stuff. <laughs> well, I did want to say, Paul, if you would do us the honor, because we, we have so much engagement going on right now, and I feel so bad that we're not going to be able to get to everybody. Would you do us the honor of coming back for, for another time? No. Okay. Damn yes, it. I would love I'm to. gonna force you to Paul. I'll, I'll talk you online. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so everybody, if we didn't get to your question in time, Paul said he'll come back. I do. Yeah, we'll do a part two. We'll do a part two because we have so much. I mean, there's like so much going on. Um, and and before we do go though, I did want to um say we have a huge fan of librarians. And if there's any story you have from like the librarians, if you could give it to her and her husband. Oh, uh, oh, I got to think of a, of a happy story. Um, oh, no. Only happy stories allowed, Paul. <laughs> oh, no. No oh. TMZ stuff here. No. I was just yeah. going to say. No. <laughs> it, Librarians was fantastic. It was, I was, John Rogers was the showrunner of that. And he left uh, before season two started because he got another show. So I took over. He, he gave me the show running reins, which was wonderful. And it was certainly a trial by fire. But it was one of the seminal moments of or years in my life, I should say, because I, I really learned a lot on that show. Um, I learned I was better than I thought I was. And I, I just learned that I could do this job where I'd always sort of up to that point felt like I was the good, you know, second or third in command. Yes. You know, and and I learned I could do it. Um, and the majority, I won't say the entire cast. The majority of the cast was certainly lovely. And one of my very best friends in the world is Jonathan Frakes, who uh, oh, wow. one of the episodes. And so getting to be in He's Portland great. with one of my best friends directing stuff that I was writing and producing was a pure joy. Oh, that is yeah. so awesome. I think it's um, one of your TikToks. I think, it, no, I, I mean, your Instagrams, it could have been a TikTok, but I'm pretty sure it was IG. Um, you had talked about how, one of the things, I don't know if it's in the book or you were just talking about it, but you were saying that you can't always follow what everybody else tells you because you said there was something about not to put um, the heart of the story or, or the impactful moment had to be within so many pages or words or whatever, but then you brought up Rocky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't remember the exact wording, but can you? Ex it was, so yeah, so, so one of the things, you know, that, that all the books preach from Sid Field through Save the Cat 
is you have to have the inciting incident in That's the first five or saying. 10 pages of your story. And if you don't have the inciting incident in the first 10 pages, your script's garbage and it's never going to work. And so I use Rocky as an example, which is a 114 page script whose inciting incident is on page 53. Yeah. yeah. And so Sylvester Stallone took nearly half the movie just to make us fall in love with these characters and who they were yeah. and their lives and their relationships with each other. And then do you want to fight Apollo Creed for the heavyweight championship is halfway in the movie. Mm -hmm. So I just think that. it's a, I just think that is stuck in my head. And I just think it's a great <laughs> way since we're running out of time to end because it's everything your book's about. Like you can't listen to what there you've been are told. No rules. I'm gonna tell yeah. There are no there are rules. No I love that. Can you tell us again? We've got like five minutes. So can you tell us the name of the book and where people can get it? And uh, yes. so it's Kill the Dog, the first book on screenwriting to tell you the truth. And it is starting tomorrow morning or starting at, at midnight. It's available where all books are sold. You can get it at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere. What I tell people. Please support your independent bookstores. Call them and, and they'll order it for you. If, you. if you don't like going out to stores and you love to just buy stuff online, you can go to bookshop.org and you can actually, they, you can get any book in the world there. It's just like Amazon, only it's all the money goes to the independent bookstores. And you can even pick which bookstore you want to buy your book from. You just type in the name of your local bookstore that you love and order the book and they'll get the money for it. Wow, that's I love great. that. Thank you for saying yeah, that. That's yes. Awesome. That's, and the great um, thing is when you come back, Paul, we'll have all read your book. And you one lucky fan is going to get a free copy from M actually right after here. If you asked a question, you entered the contest. So actually when yeah. you come back, we're going to be able to talk with you about the book specifically because we will all have read it. How oh, cool that'll be, that? you know what? That's actually That'll be a lot of fun because like yes. I said, there's a lot of very personal stuff in the book that, that people will probably want to hear a little more on. So that, right. that's a good idea. Right. And yeah. so that's what I love. So about I will, that. I will, we'll pick tonight. Renee will go through the comments okay. and then get, make sure I didn't miss anybody. And then we'll draw our name and I will put the winner in the comments because everybody's in there. And mm -hmm. then I'll DM for information. And okay. then I'll get back with Paul to reset up. Let's, um, another... let's schedule part two, everybody. Part yes, two. please. It's a franchise I, I, I didn't now. even get to ask <laughs> my questions because everybody had such a good one. We did it. So. Yeah, that was so that, great. That's okay. how we like to roll. We just like that's how we like to roll. Here, We're starting so. our own franchise. We're starting our own franchise. This is going to be the Fast and Furious of <laughs> interviews. <laughs> this is the Fast and the Furious. We're like Absolutely. one hour. Boom. Done. And I'll watch the librarians because I haven't seen the librarians yet. So I'll also watch that. So maybe I, yeah, can, that's I can do yeah. some fun. And you know what, Renee, that. too, tell me when in seriousness, when you if you're watching NCIS New Orleans, when you when you get to the episode, I think it, I think they called it empathy, which is a terrible title. It's called but, empathy. OK. Yeah. But let me know, because that's the one you'll recognize. About and which season father. is it? Which season? Uh Three or four, whatever season okay. I was on, <laughs> I think. You know, interesting. I think, I think did you know? Four. Okay. Okay. I will definitely, and I'll shoot you a note then too. And, and, and NCIS was the only um, show Scott was on that went to a hundred. Isn't that interesting? Like quantum leap was like 98 episodes. And I think um, enterprise was like 97 NCIS is what gave him his a hundred. How cool is that? I love yeah, it. Cool. Um, so he, he yeah, I like anyway, that show too. It's oh. so good. I was just going to ask a question and then I just lost it. Um, <laughs> Everybody's so excited. We have to let him go. But yeah. um, okay, we, okay, we have many more questions for you. Um, Paul, thank you so much for being here. Yep. Everybody so read so his happy. book, everybody. Read Order it book, tonight, everyone. read it. And then we will, when we have him back, we can all discuss it. It'll be a book discussion. There you there go. You know. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Em. Thank you, everybody. And hello Bye, to the guys. Replay Thanks, Squad. Paul. We love you all. Thank Bye, you, everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye.